Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here. So, ah, I see the recording has started. Okay, good. Well, we'll get started right now then. Um, as people jump on, maybe we'll give it just a minute for people to uh, gather um, and log in to Microsoft Teams. Just a couple of things. Um, I see, let's see, everybody on already has submitted their uh, assignment number two, which was due yesterday. Um, for those that are watching this on the recording, uh, I now give another reminder. It was due yesterday. I'm still taking them, um, but just know that they'll be graded accordingly because they're late. So, but I appreciate those of you those three of you that are on right now that have already turned it in early, um, which is good. There's a new, also there's the last quiz uh, for chapter 14 posted. Uh, I just posted that yesterday. So you'll see that in last week. I think that was week 11. Um, that's there. It's a very, very short quiz. It's eight questions. Um, and that's the last of the quizzes for this um, semester class. Okay, so the, all that we have left is uh, the final exam, um, which will be coming up in a couple of weeks. And I had mentioned um, in the last class, I will upload the final exam at least a week before the last class to give you all time to complete it. Um, it's 100 questions, and I figure you'll probably need some time to review. Um, and so just keep in mind that the um, materials that we covered in the quizzes will be very, very similar to what you see in the final exam. Um, so if you've gone through the quizzes and you go through the, the book and the notes, you'll have a very, um, I won't say easy time, but it will be much more smooth for you in taking the exam. All right, so looks like it's just to be a, a, a small class today, um, which is okay. I mean, those people will come on. I think I saw Ashraf come on and come off and somebody else. So maybe they're having trouble with their uh, internet right now. All right, so today it's a topic that is very helpful no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're engaged in. And that's about managing our time better. Um, the other piece, obviously, is if we're in sales or if we are in business and have a assigned territory, um, we could use the word responsibility as well, because sometimes it's not necessarily a geographic territory. It's a responsibility for something, um, a certain amount of customers, a certain amount of people that we manage. So again, we don't need to be in sales for this particular topic to be very helpful for us. Again, managing time, managing our activities, managing um, the people, our contacts. That's what we're gonna talk about today to do it a little more effectively. Some of the things you may have already uh, practiced. Some of these things might be a little new. Um, and so we'll, we'll follow along and, and uh, have a good discussion on ways to be more effective um, in what we're doing, because that's what it comes down to. All right. So what is this uh, material about? We'll just kind of look at some of the objectives. Um, and as you think about why is time so valuable for salespeople, for us, right? Um, I could think along that question. Um, do we waste time? I think we all kind of, there are moments where we, we could say we waste. I don't know necessarily how much, but we could always be more efficient with our time. I don't know if waste is the right word because sometimes we're relaxing. Sometimes we're maybe not engaged in something that's as productive, okay? And there's always the need for downtime. So we always want to look at that you know, why is time so valuable and what can we do to create more time? Literally, um, more selling time, more time to build relationships, more time to be more um, following up, 
to, to communicate better. So we're going to look at those kinds of strategies. Um, then we're get, getting into the specifics and sales. And again, you, you could have a responsibility at your job to cover a certain um, part of the whole of a project. So this will help with that as well. What should you consider when you're devising a strategy to cover your territory or to cover your project? So we'll talk about that. Um, and how does this ter uh, territory strategy or project strategy or activity strategy, if you will, relate to building partnerships? That's important, to building long-term relationships. And what should we do to um, analyze, to make sure we are efficient, to make sure we are managing our activities, our, our sales calls, the communications we have, we're doing it well, reflecting on results, seeing what we're, um, is this next piece here, results, our performance. We always want to do better, and it's not necessarily a, a, you know, a lot better. Maybe it's just a little bit better, a little more efficient, a little more aware of where we're spending our time, and that will build a lot of um, efficiency into what we're doing. So this thing about the value of time, okay? You know, 24 hours a day, I think it's 1,440 minutes every day. Comes down to, I don't know if anybody knows how many seconds in any day, but it's about 86,000, and I think it's either 400 or 600 seconds. 86,000 seconds. And as I'm speaking, we're just ticking off another second and another second. And so it's not necessarily looking at every single second of every single day to be more effective and be more efficient, because that is overkill. But it's to look at where we're spending our time and where we can be more efficient. And that's the question, right? How do we allocate our resources? Time is a resource. Our focus is a resource. How we're spending our time is a resource. If we choose to, we'll say, uh, engage in downtime, which we do need to recover, recovery is very important. How does that look? Can we be more efficient with our spending our time in terms of recovery? And so, and then let's look at, we're gonna look at all the difference here in, in terms of time. The difference between, we'll say, this impacts everyone, no matter what we're doing. Being really great, stellar in our performance, even in one day or one interaction, versus average performance, which is still okay. Um, and I have a friend who is a uh, pastor and he wrote a book called Addicted to Average because there's this thing about being comfortable and average is okay, right? You're doing your job and you're getting things done and you're doing okay. Is that what we want or do we want to be a level two or three above average? I think we all kind of aspire to do better than average. So we'll talk about how to allocate these resources. Um, this is a really good graphic just to kind of get a sense of um, how we manage ourselves, how we manage this process. And it, it is a process, it is a cycle. And you can kind of see here um, that everything is related and, and because of this cycle. So we set goals, right? We talked about that in terms of our objectives. What is our objectives in terms of this class? What are objectives in terms of the whole class? Um, objectives in terms of sales, objectives in terms of your day, objectives in terms of a communication with somebody. And that always, re those directly relate and impact the sales strategy or the strategy of how we allocate our resources. Because we set goals, right? And then we have a certain amount of resources that we divvy up, that we allocate to figure out, okay, 
What can we do to get those goals? And then it impacts, this directly impacts the time we spend. Our strategies impact the time and it impacts the territory strategy, or you could say our ability to manage projects. And then that impacts, again, it's building awareness for how things are going. And that builds awareness to see, are, are we efficient with our time? Are we getting things done? Are we closing a sale? Are we being effective in serving our customers, our prospects? Are we being effective in managing the relationships we have with our family, with our friends, with our coworkers? And that's when they evaluate performance. And then again, that feeds into goals. If we're doing maybe not so great at evaluating, if, if we evaluate performance and we say we're not doing so great, maybe the goals we set, maybe they're not as um, appropriate. Maybe we not need to look at some different goals or different ways to have strategies to get at those goals. So we'll talk about that. And then this business of relationship goals, because it is important, right? Thinking, what do we want? So in life, I think there's really, you know, this is broader than just this class, but again, this class is about communicating and connecting with others. And I think you kind of get a sense of, there's a couple of really important questions. These are two really big questions. Where am I at and what do I want? That feeds into goals, where am I at, right? It doesn't have to be exactly in sales. It could be, okay, where am I at in this class and what do I want out of this class? Where am I at in my job and what do I want out of my job? Where am I at in the day and what do I want out of the day? Where am I at in this relationship with this particular client? And what do I want out of this client? So you can kind of see, we have to know where we're at. That's the evaluation piece. And then we have to know what we want. So I ask you to kind of think about that in all these functional areas of your life. And that's what this will show you. What do we want and where are we at? So lifestyle, where and how do we live? what's important to us, our family, our personal growth, et cetera. You know, so that's a huge piece, right? And then directly related to our lifestyle is our career, right? What is it, what is it that we're doing with our time? Because we're talking about time management. And what do we want to accomplish right now and in the future with our company, with our career? And that feeds directly into our sales goals. Again, if you're not in sales, you could say your company goals, what it is it that you want to do in your project if you're managing a project or you're communicating with somebody um, in a particular way, what is the goal there? Performance, right? Again, we're going to measure the performance. We're going to know, again, specifically for sales, how many new accounts are we developing? What is the total sales? And what does it look like in units, right? But if we're in service mode, if we're selling consulting services, well, there's still a revenue that we're generating. It may not be units. It may be units in a different perspective, time allocation. So kind of start thinking. And then that's those sales goals feed into, again, as we talked about in the last um, uh, slide, activities. What is it that we're doing? How many calls are we making? Who are we talking to? Are the people we're talking to the right people? How many proposals are we making? Um, the number of, we'll say, demonstrations. How many calls on the phone? How many emails? How many um, direct mail, if we're using that? And, and those activities also then relate into what are we, the word conversion goals, which is just a way to say the goals that we set for ourselves, are they becoming reality? How many of our activities are actually leading to being more effective and closing a sale and closing a communication, whatever objective we want? And so we look at, okay, 
conversion is maybe the number of new accounts we have, maybe the number of current accounts we have. Can we expand their business? We talked about that last um, last class, right? And how many new proposals? Again, this word of demonstrations and proposals, you know, because we're looking to increase our effectiveness. So maybe it's not always just the number of proposals, but how effective do we word the proposal? So maybe they convert more um, often, right? Because I know a lot of, and I think I mentioned this before, when I got into sales, people always said sales is a numbers game. You need to call as many people as you can. And remember that funnel um, diagram from a number of weeks ago where Tony was about leads into prospects, into customers, into satisfied customers. Again, that's a whole process, right? That's a process of conversion of our goals because the end game is to have a satisfied customer, a satisfied employee, a satisfied boss, a satisfied somebody in your family, right? Based on the communication, based on the goals, based on what it is we, we want, right? So again, this picture of these two questions, where am I at, which is the evaluation and what do I want? And then to reflect on that within the relationship of, that we have. All right, so we can look at the nature of goals. We'll talk a little bit about these. And, and I think we mentioned this SMART goals before. You may have heard that term. We'll talk just a second about that because it's kind of important just to think. Um, we did mention this in one of the earlier weeks of this, this class, probably back in February. Um, goals should be specific, right? Of course they should be because if they're very nebulous, how do we measure them? Because that gets into, if they're not specific, it's hard to measure. And measure is an evaluation, okay? Again, we're tracking, we're seeing if what we want, of what we set our intention for is being um, realized. So we need a way to measure it. And then it's achievable, right? So if it's specific and measurable, it becomes achievable. We make our goal. Right, so it needs to be achievable. If in your job you are looking to introduce your consulting service, your software, your um, credit service, whatever it is that you have, your financial services to new customers, expand your reach, it's gotta be re realistic within reason, okay? I always say err on the side of more than you think you could possibly do, but not crazy. If you know in the past you've been able to get two new clients in a month, and that's the best you did, is it realistic to say you're gonna get 20 new clients? Probably not. And that creates a little more pressure, but three is possible, right? Maybe four or five is possible. So that's realistic. And that might expand your realistic as you get better at your job as you get more efficient, what's realistic now might be different in three months from now. Think about that. And time base is meaning that we'll set the goal up. Can I do this in three months? Can I do this in six months? Is this a year goal? Is this a, a weekly goal? You know, just so always to have a, a way to kind of evaluate what we're doing. Again, what do we want? Right, and where are we at? And we can piece this SMART goal into that kind of model, right? And so this is the thing. People tend to set goals and forget them. I would say I'm guilty of that myself, right? I think we all are. We set a goal, we forget it. So sometimes, and I know, and I'll tell you, I have lots of these post-it notes around, okay? Um, as reminders. Reminders, obviously we set a goal, but what are the tasks? What are the things that we can control directly in this moment, in this day, in this week that can lead to these goals? And so I write them down. So it keeps my mind focused. What do I need to do? It gets back to where am I at? 
am I being efficient with my time? Again, I, I, I say this, you don't have to be efficient 100% all the time, okay? That's probably not realistic and that's not possible, right? But we wanna be more efficient, maybe a little more efficient each day with our time. And that will build even 1% more efficient over the course of a year, that's 42 plus percent more efficient. Imagine that. Could you be 1% more efficient than you were yesterday? Could you? Think about that. With one thing, could you be 1% more efficient? I think so. You pick the one thing and 1% is not a lot, right? So how do you do that? And that's what we're gonna talk about, all right? So getting into goals again, the SMART goals, just looking at some of the types of goals we can set, all right? Again, even if we're not in sales, we should look at the possibilities of goals and what we do and how we set them. We may not have thinking about goals. We may not have thought, thinking is not a word, come on. Um, we may not have thought about goals before in this way. Performance goals, okay? Performance goals are things that are related to outcomes, okay? And they're great. How many, how many, um, how much money do I wanna make? How much sales revenue do I wanna generate? You know, those kinds of things. How much money do I wanna put aside for my retirement each month? Performance goals. Um, how much, you know, in terms of how many new clients are gonna buy my software in the next six months? Okay, but the thing about performance goals is a lot of those we set and they're great. We can't directly impact in terms of, we can't control them in terms of the outcome, the result. I mean, I could say I wanna be a top 10 salesperson in my company. I could say I want 100 new clients at the end of a year. Can I control that? Not really. I can control the process of getting that, that goes into that. And that's the second piece here, these activity goals. Activity goals are about what are you doing? What are we doing? How are we doing it? How are we being with what we're doing it? That's attitude, things we can control. So we can't control performance, yet we wanna set those as targets. But when we look at our performance, what goes into them are the activities, the day-to-day -day things, the moment-to-moment -moment things that we're doing, our behaviors. And we need to reflect on what are, what is it that we're doing, our efforts. And so what we then have is something called intermediate goals. So I have a big goal that says I wanna make X amount of money, or I want 100 new clients at the end of the year. Well, that seems like a lot. Um, maybe how about 15 new clients at the end of the year, okay? Maybe 100 is not a lot, but we'll say 15 new clients. That would be great. One a month plus one every extra a quarter, okay? And that's an intermediate goal is like looking at, okay, I need, if I want 15 new clients at the end of the year, that's one new, one and a quarter new clients every month. The intermediate goal is that. And the intermediate goal then becomes, what can I do? What are my daily activities, my behaviors that will go right into getting clients? So maybe how many calls are you making? Things you can control, how often, you, how efficient you are with your time. You can control that most of the time, right? There are emergencies that pop up, things that happen that suck your time away from you. And those we'll talk about, those are, you know, maybe what's urgent, okay? But what we really need to do, and this comes back to that book I mentioned uh, a number of weeks ago, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. There's a difference between focusing on what is urgent versus focusing on what's important. Urgent versus important. Those are big pieces. 
when we focus most on what's urgent, and I have a couple of partners that I work with that focus too much on what's urgent. So they're always in crisis mode. They're never focusing on what's important. What's important is the behaviors that I'm doing that may not impact right away, but though they will impact later on. And so then it becomes, okay, what is it we're doing our daily tasks? And then again, reflecting on results, conversion goals. How efficient are we doing? We look at our measures, those SMART goals, the measure goals, right? What it is, what is it that we're doing and how are we converting, right? And so obviously there's this term benchmarking. We're comparing our performance to others. Sometimes we do it too much, right? It's best to do it with ourselves. How did we do last year? Can we do better this year? How did we do last month? Can we do better this month? What does it mean to do better, right? We need to look at that. So benchmarking, not necessarily with always the other people in your company, but how you did last year, last month, last week. Again, if you're 1% better each day, more efficient in managing time and managing your resources and managing what you're doing and allocating that, then it becomes certainly something you can control and impact. And that drives you, builds momentum towards getting your goals. It also gives you an ability to see, okay, I might be falling short here. What then do I need to do? Okay, so when you're setting goals, just kind of start to think about a few things, right? Activity goals should be set after performance goals. These are, the activity goals are what you can directly impact. In my mind, activity goals are more important. These are what you focus on day to day. You don't necessarily focus on, okay, 100 new clients in a year or 15 new clients in a year. That's a goal that's set out there, but you don't look at that every single moment. What you need to do is focus on the activities that drive your ability to get those 15 new clients in the year, all right? So that's the biggest piece, the biggest takeaway, I think, from this entire chapter on goals and on how to manage our time is that the allocation of our resources and where we're spending our time, are we focused on things we can control directly? And those are the activity goals. What is it we're doing and how are we doing it? And that determines, you know, part of it is determined by um, our, our desire to achieve a certain performance, right? So say we set out, sometimes the one thing those SMART goals didn't set out is sometimes these need to be exciting, okay? They need to be motivating. I think part of that M for SMART goals instead of measurable, it should be they need to be motivating to us because sometimes the company sets goals, right? They set big goals. They set different kinds of goals than maybe we set we need to look at, okay, they set their goals. My boss has this particular goal and this project. How do I take that and use that? What can I be excited about? If I'm excited about my goals, then my desire increases to perform the day in and day out activities. The day in and day out activities are not as exciting sometimes. Oh, it is exciting to think about, hmm, I want to make $100,000 this next year or increase my revenue by $50,000, increase my bonus, because maybe that's directly tied to how you're producing. Maybe I want to max out my bonus. I want an extra $10,000 in my bonus. Can you control that? No, what you can control is the day-to-day -day activities. And sometimes they're mundane tasks, following up with a customer, following up with a client, doing the follow-up work in terms of looking at, okay, how am I doing? What do, where am I at? And what do I want, right? And sometimes those things change. 
Certainly. All right, so let's move along here. Let's look at resources. Resource to be allocated and where to allocate them. What are our resources? We kind of think about what we have to offer. Time is a resource. It's a big one. But when we think about physical resources, what is the physical resources that we can allocate? Okay, to a company, they represent a cost to the company. Their physical resources are their salespeople, are their employees. Those are physical resources. And obviously, their physical resources are also the products, the services that make those employees better. Physical resources. In economics, if you've taken economics as part of this MBA, they call it labor. Right? We're labor, right? Maybe we don't like to look at ourselves as labor, but we're labor. We're, the, we're a cost to our company. And because of that, we need to be more efficient. So when they look at allocating resources, it's a big part of it. So it gets down to if we're in sales or if we're with a company, they look at us, the boss, our boss, their boss, the company, the, the, the investors of the company, look at us like investments. They do. How much money are we spending in our employees? I just read a couple of days ago that McDonald's, we all know McDonald's, right? Fast food, whether we've eaten there recently or not, we know McDonald's, the Golden Arches. They closed worldwide every corporate office this week. Every corporate office, why? because they're gonna be laying off people. And they said, don't contact anybody, don't contact your clients, don't contact your suppliers, just stay home and do your job this week, but don't call anybody because we're gonna be reallocate, reallocating resources, which means downsizing. They have, I think, I read it was 75,000 corporate employees, quite a few. Um, seems like they should have more than that, but that's what I read, 75,000 corporate employees. That's not people working in the restaurants. These are corporate. Um, and they're gonna scale that back. Obviously they look at who is a, a, a better investment and who is not pulling their weight to be more efficient. So they're allocating the resources better, downsizing. We see it in lots of places, right? Um, so the more efficient we are, the better off we're going to be in terms of managing our overall value to our employer. Okay, so where do we allocate the resources? Just kind of think about salespeople, we allocate resources by finding our customers or companies that are going to buy. So our day-to-day -day activities are allocated, got to find new customers, or I got to be able to, we talked about this last week and the week before, expand existing customers, right? And we talked about how to do that. We talked about overcoming objections to do that, right? But if we can get a customer to rebuy, buy more or buy differently some new products and services that we have, more efficient. And then we maximize our opportunities by doing that, okay? So let's look at this when we classify accounts. So if we have clients, even if we're not in sales, we look at our projects in this way. We look at our activities in this way. We got to classify them, okay, to see are we allocating our resources efficiently. So for salespeople, certainly we have to classify our customers on the basis of their potential, right? There's lots of ways to do that. If you're not in sales, think about this. How do you classify your activities in the project you're working on or this, the, the marketing that you're doing, the activities? How do you classify? what is more efficient, what is a better possibility for generating uh, potential revenue, profit, okay? 
So we must concentrate on things that are more profitable, more profitable customers, more profitable activities, more profitable is not just money. Profitable is also better efficient, profitable in terms of building a relationship long term. Okay. So it's this noticing awareness. What are we doing? Okay, what do we want and where are we at? Noticing that. Noticing where are we spending our time? Who are those that are more have a greater chance of generating more revenue? Are more profitable customers or more profitable projects or more profitable activities? Spend more time doing that and less time working on those that have less impact, less uh, customers that have less opportunity. We still can follow up with those customers. You know, when I was in the book business selling textbooks, and I've used this example before, or at least talk, talked about this profession, selling physical books, working with professors to use it, just like we're using the Castleberry book here. It's online, but before that, there were lots of physical books in bookstores and people were buying those. I had certain professors I would call on that would have large sections of classes, okay? And other professors that would specialize and they would have small classes. Now, I couldn't ignore everybody, right? If they, you know, I, I couldn't ignore those that had very little business because every once in a while, those people that teach specialized higher level classes would take an intro class. But I would allocate my time, my resources, make sure that I spend a little bit more, a little bit more time with those that are more profitable, bigger sections, but still allocate some time to those that are less profitable. Because you can have a lot of less profitable customers, a lot of those, if you work efficiently with them, we'll talk about that in a moment, right? And maybe 10 smaller customers equate to one big customer. And so you got to manage your time and figure that out. How do you allocate your resources? That's what it comes down to. We only have so much time. We only have so much uh, focus power. What is the best way to do that? So when we think about, um, looking at our customers, okay, looking at our projects. Um, my, my brother is a project manager. And so he has lots of projects that need to get done in a couple of year period. Some are shorter term, some are longer term. He has to allocate his resources. He needs to focus on, okay, what are those projects that are more important? And how do I rank them? How do I know? Maybe there's 12 things that need to get done over the next three years in a project. How do I, how do I rank them? And we do the same thing when we're in sales or we do the same thing when we're looking at serving our clients, serving our potential customers, our prospects, okay? So we can rate them and rank them based on their potential. What can they give us in six months or a year? Now, it's not a perfect science, like we're projecting potential. And you can look at, you have customers already, and you can see how they did last year and how they've grown in the last three years. You can see that. And based on that of existing customers, you can say, well, if I bring another client in like this customer to generate this kind of revenue, that's a good potential. And so for me and my business right now, in terms of coaching and uh, training, and you know, some of it is product sales and some of it is speaking, I look at, okay, I have a couple of partners. We talked about partnerships, right? Long-term developing that. And I'm looking at creating new partners. I want a couple of new partners. So I look at how do I spend my time? Who do I focus on to generate those? Right. And I obviously I can't contact everybody all at the same time. I have to be efficient. I have to classify based on potential. So I look at, OK, what are those clubs 
we'll say, that have members that I could coach. Again, I coach in terms of mental skills and mindfulness, in terms of working with people to be more efficiently working with their minds, right? And so if they have athletes to work with, the larger clubs that have more athletes, probably more potential, better for me. But sometimes they're too large and they take too much time. So maybe that's not the high priority. Maybe that is a lower priority because it's going to take me five years to get in there. So I have to be, it's not necessarily always about how much revenue generated. It's also how quickly can I turn and get that revenue? Okay, so you need to be looking at that. And then you could kind of think about this being effective for industries. It's a little different. You know, sometimes this is what I'm saying here. Is it going to take me to contact them? Do I have to contact them every week, every month? Or can I build that relationship by contacting them every six weeks, eight weeks and still be effective? So if you remember when we talked about effective communication, we had that 80-20 rule in terms of we should be listening 80% of the time and speaking 20% of the time. A good salesperson, a good communicator does that. And if that's the case, if we're only talking 20% of the time, we need to be effective and efficient with the questions we're asking. And this drives, if we, if we communicate in order to solve an objection, if we're good at asking questions, we can get the customer to share a lot more about what objections they have. And so the 80-20 rule is important. It also is important here. 20% of your business um, this 80-20, uh, Wilfer, Wilfred Pareto, it's called the Pareto Principle, okay? It's a couple hundred years old. That's where the 80-20 rule comes from. 20% of your clients will give you 80% of your revenue, usually. Do you think about that? So if that's the case, 20% of your accounts are worth the most. And what are those accounts? And so companies look at this, you know, and we look at this, how much time are we spending with those 20%? Should it be 80% of our time with the 20%? Maybe, maybe it, maybe it should be 50%. It varies here, but you classify, then there's the B accounts, the A accounts are your top 20. The B accounts are the other 80%, okay? That are smaller business potential. They're still important, but they're a little less important in terms of managing time. And then you have, you can classify C accounts. Customers and accounts are low potential. Maybe you don't have them as customers yet, and you're not really sure how much potential they have. Okay. But there's still some value. You still follow up with them. You're still aware of them. Because here, a C account, this is important, a C account right now, today, might become a B account next year, might become an A account in two years. So you don't neglect the C accounts just because you rank them as less important, right? Absolutely. Because this is the long-term planning. This is the vision we need to think about. We can't ignore everybody. And at the same time, we can't give 100% effort to everybody. So this is why we're talking about we need to classify. We need to have a system. We talked about this a couple of times, the CRM system, customer relationship management system. How are we tracking our activities so that we can follow up effectively? Okay. And this gets into how do we manage these relationships? Relationship analysis. You know, it's just noticing, okay, classifying our accounts based on relationship. We can do it, okay, based on potential revenue. We could also do it based on relationship. Think about this. Um, and how do we do it? R new relationships. If we're developing new relationships, those take more time, don't they? Many, usually they do. 
new customers, you, you have a new, new uh, client, um, a new project. You, when you take on a new project at your company, it takes more time in the beginning, right? Absolutely, because it's new. You have to get familiar with the. You're not as efficient right away as you will be in three months. And so, because it's new, it takes more time. Short-term relationships. Those are customers that you may have had for three months, shorter term uh, clients, um, projects you've only been working on a short period of time. Again, maybe you're not as efficient, but you divvy up your time based on these. You could, this is a method to do that. And then long-term relationships. Again, we're not neglecting uh, customers, but if you have a long-term relationship, if you built that partnership, maybe you don't need to be with them every single day. Maybe they give you a little slack, but you still need to follow up with them. So you divvy up, okay, these are the new people, new relationships, shorter term, longer term. And then there's this piece about, I had a customer, I had a project, I had a client, and we lost it. That's a potential. And so we need a way to look at it. Maybe we lost to a competitor. Maybe your boss took projects away from you and gave it to one of your coworkers. Winning that back, maybe you liked working on that project. It was something you did well. Maybe they took some responsibilities away. Can you get those back by being more efficient? So it's not like you're just forgetting, okay, I lost that business. It's always like, I lost that business, can I win it back? And how can I win it back? Obviously, you can't spend all your time on the lost business and winning it back because then you're neglecting the new, the short, and the long term, your existing customers, right? But again, it's something you need to think about and consider as we become more efficient. And there's no perfect way to do this. But as I said in the very, very beginning class, this word awareness self-aware, right? How we're feeling, what we're thinking, and awareness of what we're doing, our activities. And so then it becomes like, can we be a little more aware? Can we be a little more efficient? Can be a little more effective? And then it becomes, yes, of course we can be a little 1%, right? And so, this will change based on relationships. And again, those short-term relationships, hopefully they become long-term. Hopefully those new clients and, and projects become a little bit more longer term. And hopefully you do win back some, some clients that you lost. And then they become maybe new, maybe they're not new, maybe they come, you know, shorter term relationships. You, but you could have had a long-term relationship with somebody, a customer and lost the business. It happens. Maybe sometimes they go out of business. Clients go out of business. Companies go out of business. And a year or two later, they get new resources and reestablish themselves and come back. That happens, right? Can we get those customers back? And as we look at this, um, and we, we talked a little bit about this before, like using different types of relationships. I'm not going to spend much time because this is just kind of a review. Um, transactional are, you know, you pay for one product and you sell it, boom, right? Functional, functional relationships are all about your suppliers. Maybe you're working with a buyer and it's their employees within there. And we talked about whether it's relational partnership or strategic, right? And again, there's a blend of those two. So just kind of keep in mind as you look at the relationships, you keep these pieces in mind as well. Um, let's look a little bit about, again, we'll, we'll kind of, again, this is all on the same way. How do we engage and become more efficient? How do we classify things? And so we can use a grid. Grids are great, kind of, you know, different axes to kind of think about, okay? We'll use this, we'll, we'll call it like a sales call grid. But again, you can use it as if you're managing a project or an activity, you're managing an activity. It's great for that. And you control what you put on the X and the Y axis. But let's, let's look at it. I mean, this is a class in sales. So let's look at a sales call allocation grid. 
we think about classifies in our, our accounts, right? We're talking about those that are potential on the basis of how competitive they can be and their potential, right? Competitive meaning are 10 other salespeople going to be trying to get that business from that account? That's competitive. Or maybe only five. That's still competitive. Maybe it's, maybe it's hard. And so only two people go after them, a little less competitive. But maybe it doesn't generate as much revenue potential. That's, that's what we have to look at. So then we kind of look, look at this, this grid. And really what it does, it helps determine how much resource we should spend, how much time, how much energy. And then we look at, OK, we have this grid. And we'll talk about this. This was a great exhibit in the book. How do we determine how we're doing? How do we evaluate where we're at? So it's a great thing in terms of these two questions I mentioned at the very beginning. Where am I at? If you haven't written this down, write it down. Where am I at? What is what? What do I want? Those pieces, those two questions, you could keep asking throughout the whole engagement process. Where am I at? What is it I'm noticing? And okay, checking in, right? And then what do I want? The goals. Where am I at with the goals? How am I doing with those? Again, you don't have to micromanage every moment, but those two questions are really helpful. Okay. And so what does this look like? And and this might be familiar to you if you if you looked at this on on the the uh, in the book. Um, but just kind of think about this from a standpoint of account opportunity. Opportunity to grow, right? Business revenue is what we're talking about. If you're going to work for yourself one day, this is important. Even if you're not in sales and you're going to get into business for yourself, I know, and I know there's a few people on this call and that are going to be doing that, think about that opportunity. And the other piece is, again, strength of your position, okay? Again, strength of your position meaning is it strong or weak, okay? Your position, how good are you at managing things? How good are you at being able to probe and ask good questions? Close, how good at you are you able to satisfy objections, right? How good of a communicator are you? Are you really good at being able to remember that personality styles matrix we talked about? Are you good at being able to adapt your style, adaptive selling, to close business, to communicate more effectively? Or are you in a weak position? Maybe you can't do that very well yet. You're learning that. So this becomes a really good matrix we should look at, OK? based on account, and again, we can change the variables. This is just how we look at it, this particular one, account opportunity and um, strength of position. But you can kind of see, is attractiveness, are these accounts like high potential? That's high opportunity, right? Um, do they generate a lot of revenue? The project I'm working on, does it have a lot of potential to make me look better at my job and more efficient in my role, okay? And then we could also look at like the, our call strategy. Again, this gets into things we can control. I can control where I'm spending my time and who I'm calling. So if you have lots of different potential customers, what are those accounts? Where am I spending my time? Do they have high potential? Yes. And of course, we're not neglecting those that have low potential because those that have low potential might become high potential later on. But we need to look at that. We need to be aware of that. And then the attractiveness and the sales strategy becomes different if we're not in a position of strength, okay? Because sometimes accounts, they might look like, oh, they're attractive. Okay, it looks like it's got high potential. Right, but it's very sophisticated, meaning that it might take you three years to develop that. So you don't have a, a, a strong position. Maybe it's a weaker position right away. Maybe you don't have the technical skill developed yet. So it, it becomes like, again, 
we look at this to say, where do we spend our time? It's just another way to assess, to look at, to allocate, where do we focus, right? And so then it becomes this, okay, looking, we, we always want to increase our share, our account share, right? With a specific person, not always increasing number of accounts, okay? And sometimes we want to increase both, certainly. But what we should, some companies and a lot of companies look to increase how much business within existing customers that you have, okay? Maybe you only get 50%, you have a buyer, maybe they only give you 50% of their potential sales. Again, your suit manufacturer selling suits, they have a retail store, they have 20 of them. They bring in other manufacturers. You're one of 12 manufacturers they bring in. Could you increase their business? Absolutely. Sometimes companies look to do that rather than say, okay, who are the other potential distributors out there I could sell to? You do both, right? But how do you allocate your resources and how do you determine the potential? So you look at this, these balancing of customer share versus account share, okay? And it becomes kind of a grid in a sense too. Because then you look at, okay, what is the average business, the percentage of business that I have from these accounts in a particular category, right? So maybe I have different suits. Maybe I have winter suits and summer suits and spring suits. So I need to look at that. How, my, how many winter suits is this company buying? They're not buying a lot of summer suits. Why is that? How can I increase that share, right? And so then it becomes, you know, this, this term share of wallet, which is basically, it's similar to a customer share, but it's an individual, right? For us, right? I, I don't have my wallet on me right now, but like you share your wallet. You have certain resources in your wallet, certain amount of cash, right? How do you allocate that cash based on who you, what you're buying, right? You go to a grocery store. How do you allocate the funds you have to purchase what you want, right? Maybe you're purchasing, you know, you're on a, a, a new diet, right? And, and you're, so you're changing your buying habits of what foods you're purchasing. And we want to be efficient with what we're buying, right? So we need to look at, okay, what is the, what do I want? Where am I at and what do I want? And based on that, then you determine, okay, what are the resources I have right now? And how do I allocate those resources? So this kind of classification system is useful in all places, not just for sales. So we need to kind of think about that. All right, we'll, we'll finish this uh, classification scheme um, and then we'll take a little break here. Um, look at, when we classify the, the, the ways that we're engaging with these accounts, sometimes it's like um, looking at how we're investing our time. There's lots of different ways. Again, some, some salespeople invest time Sometimes it's, you can think about, we spend our time with demoing things, giving free samples. Sometimes we spend our time training customers. You're onboarding a new client for your consulting. That takes time. Do you do it or does your company do it? Sometimes we do it. Sometimes we have resources for our company and they do it, but we need to be engaged with the process, right? So we need to kind of think about as we invest our time, where are we putting it? And how do we how do we know what's efficient? Companies use modeling, right? I think there's a few people in here in the financial and the credit world and the financial resource world. Um, they use models, modeling to determine which accounts are more productive than others, right? We have schemes that we kind of this this is what we classify these schemes. Your company might have ways of looking at potential clients, potential customers. And so they kind of predict who's gonna give us the most revenue, who's gonna give us the most potential. So this predictive modeling becomes important because then it determines where we invest our time, if we use that. And some of it is not 
necessarily like high grade um, modeling with computer software. It's not, sometimes we do it ourselves in terms of, okay, again, I work for myself now and I look at who are the potential prospects and customers, and who are the potential new partners that I can generate. And I kind of set up a modeling system based on what's worked before, knowing that it might not work next time, but if it worked before, there's a good chance it might work next time. And so that's kind of how I look at, okay, where am I spending my time? How do I allocate my main resource, my energy, my effort, and my time, okay? And then as we think about this, um, a pipeline analysis. We've talked about pipeline. Pipeline is like this um, amount that we can expect. It's like this is the channel of revenue we look at. We're used to identify managed sales opportunity, our pipeline. Can use it in marketing. It's a marketing pipeline, right? Marketers use this all the time, and I use it a little bit too. And like my pipeline for potential when I'm looking at leads. What is my lead generation pipeline? How many are going through my funnel? Because I have a funnel too. How many are going through that pipeline? It's also known as, is it opportunity management? How do we manage all that, right? How do we manage taking a potential lead to a satisfied customer? Taking a potential new project to a completed project. How do we manage that, okay? And so then we can kind of look at how do we do that? We can be assisted by the CRM systems, right? Software helps us. I put a lot of things on an Excel spreadsheet, potential customers, and I look at that, and I look at when I've talked to them last and who I spoke to and how I communicated with them. And did I make headway? Did, did I communicate with them effectively? Is it still hanging out there? How often do I need to follow up? And then I can determine, reflecting on results. How often am I contacting them? How often am I converting them? How often, how much time do I spend and how often am I doing it in the job that I'm doing? And then how often, how long does it take for them to be an existing customer? Sometimes it's short. Can I be more efficient? So if I generate a lead, somebody generates a lead for me, I'm pretty good at converting. I'm really good, okay? 90 plus percent of the people I talk to will use my services. But that's only because I'm very good at sifting through the, the leads and prospects. I'm really good at that and noticing and fine tuning my message and my objectives. I'm really good at that. And so when I spend my time with a potential customer, potential client, somebody who's gonna bring me on to be their coach, I've already done a lot of work ahead of time. We talked about this, right? Looking at where we're spending our time ahead of time. Objectives, doing all that work ahead of time. I'm, I'm really focused on that. So then it drives my efficiency later on. And it assures that I have enough opportunities for later, okay? Because now I can kind of see how many of those do I need and how long it takes. And it does require you identify which stage my people are at, right? Which stage, like, are they a lead? Does somebody just give me a lead? I get an email from somebody, I heard about you from a, you know, this happens, a referral. Somebody, you know, just recently reached out to me. A, a satisfied customer gave them my name. They called, somebody called me or sent me an email. It's been a month, I still have not talked to them. I'm gonna be talking to them later this week. Sometimes it takes that long, right? But I need to follow up. I need to be really good at managing my time. I can't keep calling and emailing these people, right? But I have to have a system to do that. And so they are in the lead stage. I don't even know yet. Now they're a qualified lead, but once I talk to them initially, then we'll figure out. And it sounds like 
the initial conversation will generate a stronger potential to close the business, right? So let's take about 10 minutes, okay? Um, th this next part is, is really important, I think. Who, who doesn't want tips for managing time as a, as a per as a employee, as a salesperson? So we'll, we'll talk about that. So kind of, you know, make sure that you come back in 10 minutes, um, pique your interests, right? Um, and then we'll finish, we'll finish this, this uh, chapter out. Okay, so take 10 minutes and I'll see you all back. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, before I get into this, I'm just curious for those that are on the call right now, um, I'd like you know, somebody to share, you know, as we talk about tips for managing time, I'm just curious and, you know, we all have different ways we manage time. Again, even if we're not in sales, we have managed uh, our resources differently. And I'm curious if one or two people would like to be willing to share some of the ways that they manage their time during the day to be more efficient. So what, what resources do you use? How do you manage your time? Um, whether you're a salesperson or not, but obviously we're all, you know, in the MBA program, we're all professionals. So we all have careers during our, our work. What is it that you're doing to manage your time more effectively? And, um, you know, if you would be able to share that, that would be great. So somebody could unmute yourself and, and go ahead and share. That would be amazing. Um, you know, certainly you can type it in the chat, but I think if you could share um, live, um, that would be great. So let's see. So the calendar and the iPhone, certainly, is that a, absolutely. I think you think about ways and, and things we share. Um, Elena puts, use the task manager. Um, it's ClickUp, so a task manager. Again, we're talking about activities, right? And how do we manage our time? And to notice, part of it is being aware of where we're spending our time and noticing then, are we as efficient as we need to be? So there are lots of great systems. Um, there's also lots of great distractions available, right? Um, the iPhone is a distraction sometimes or the internet um, or other people could be distractions sometimes. So we need to be very efficient with what we're doing. Um, Anything else? So we have the iPhone and people use a task manager, ClickUp. Um, what else do you use to manage your time and your resources? I'm sure, you know, do you, some people have even paper calendars, you know, or binders, right? Um, like I said, I use those things on my phone. I also use Excel spreadsheets to manage time. Um, Google Calendar, absolutely. If, especially if you want to sharing it among multiple people, um, that's a great way to use. So there's lots of tools. We'll talk a few about a few of those things, but certainly start to think about what we do and notice just because we're doing it right now, um, Naran put one note, Microsoft Calendar, papers, absolutely. So these are all good things. And just kind of ask yourself, are there better ways to allocate our resources? Could I use two different things? Would that be more helpful? Meaning, could I use an electronic system? And maybe also, like I do, I still use Post-it notes. I think they're amazing because it's so easy. And, and obviously, you get notifications and alerts, right? Which is helpful. But the activity of writing something down rather than typing, there's a little bit different process in the brain of how you remember something and it becomes more important. 
So, you know, I have various post-it notes about different things um, and I rework them, um, meaning that I look at them and, and use them in different ways. I put them in different places. So it becomes then you could have a calendar and change up your notes. I work with a lot of college uh, university uh, athletes. And so sometimes they have a whiteboard, literally a calendar that's a whiteboard. Um, and they put all the activities because it's very easy to see everything at once. It's hard to see everything at once if it's on your phone or in a Google calendar, literally, because you got to go week to week, day to day, month to month sometimes. But if you have it up on a whiteboard, you can then see the interaction and you can kind of see and it gives you this, oh, look at all the stuff that I've done already. That's the one thing that I think when we put it electronically that it doesn't do very well to kind of look at what we've already done to give us sort of a boost to say, you know what, what did I do before? Sometimes I have to go look at, okay, when's the last time I talked to this person? Cause they called me, I had an appointment. It wasn't on the spreadsheet cause they just called. Um, and I have to go look at the phone records or look at like, okay, wow, that was a long time ago. But if I put it up on a wall calendar, I can kind of see everything. Um, so just another way to do, you can integrate. All right, so tips for managing time. Start early, of course, right? Who doesn't want to start early? Is early enough? How early is enough, I mean. Um, think about managing a responsiveness. How often do we need to be following up if somebody calls you on the phone and leaves a message, do you have a practice if a customer calls you, if a client, versus it could be your boss? Obviously, you prioritize things differently, right? So how do you manage your responsiveness? Is it arbitrary? A friend calls you, I can't talk right now, I'm busy, or the friend is so important, you make time. It's up to you. You got to think about that. Obviously, we can schedule things in advance, certainly. And we do that. We use these calendars. We use these, you know, notes. But we can't schedule everything in advance because things pop up. Things shift. Appointments change. Things change. Um, somebody cancels, right? You, you, you have something and you're like, oh, this is more important. I need to push this other thing back. I've had call schedule where somebody te texts me 10 minutes before we're supposed to meet. You know what? Something came up. Can we move our call to later this afternoon? And I'm like, well, let me check my schedule. No, I can't. How about tomorrow? No. So sometimes it's like a week later. So you can't always schedule things in advance, but that's a great thing. And we've talked about this. Downtime. Downtime is important. Do you use it wisely? This is recovery. This is, you know, for an athlete, for a professional, this is critical. You've got to have recovery time. You can't be go, go, go all the time, right? So how do we use it effectively? How do we use it wisely? We'll talk a little bit about that too. All right. So what is the strategy that we have for implementing our time management? So we need to obviously understand good work habits, right? We need to have an idea of the activities that we do on a daily basis that are productive, right? And those that are not. And sometimes, and again, this changes because sometimes it's not productive right away because it's new. I was, I was working with, an, with, a, with an, a client, he's a tennis player, and he's learning how to string his own rackets so you have a, a tennis racket and he's learning how to string it himself. He, his dad bought him a, a, a machine to string the racket. It took him two hours the first time and he didn't do a great job. That's a long time, okay? Allocate two hours initially. But I said, when you get really good, how long should it take? An hour, 45 minutes. If you're a professional stringer, about a half hour. 
So imagine you start at two hours, then the job takes, and this is anything you do, right? We get more efficient, we get better, and it takes an hour. But there's always things that we need to do that we're not as efficient at. That's just the way it is, right? So we need to figure out what those things are and allocate properly. A lot of the times that we create good habits, it's also because we're looking long-term at things, meaning that it might take me this now and, and this later. If you get really good and you're an effective communicator in a sales call, in a talking to your boss, again, depending on the personality style, drivers might drive you to spend less time uh, breaking the ice. They don't want to hear about your vacation, but if they're amiable, as they do. So it impacts the time based on who you're talking to and what you're, so you gotta be efficient. Drivers actually make it easier to be efficient with your time because they want the facts. So it is an analytical. You need to be very precise with what you're showing them. If you're talking to amiables all the time, boy, you might get sucked into three hour conversations. You have to be careful, right? An expressive is gonna to wanna to share everything with you. Not only their vacation, but their friend's vacation that they just heard about. So what are the good work habits? Do you know what those are? Do you know where you're engaged? Where am I at? What do I want, right? And then it comes down to you look at, you know, how much time you're gonna spend prospecting and how much your time you're gonna spend with servicing customer care because those are important. It's not all about getting new business or existing customers. You got to, again, include a little bit of everything, right? You got to make time for meals. You can't just be working all the time, right? Obviously, people, there was this article I read last week or the week before in the Wall Street Journal about, because people are such on the go right now that sandwiches are big business sandwiches because you can grab something and go so quickly whether it's a food side stand or you know at the grocery store or at the at the you know um, at the restaurant at the fast food a sandwich but is sandwiches most healthy we need to think about that probably not but there's different kinds of things we can put in the sandwich that might be better now if we eat a salad that might be more healthy takes longer takes more time so it's not just a question of how much time does something take? We have to look at it. What does it get us, right? Again, time management is about looking at things in a larger perspective, but not neglecting anything, right? I mean, we have some days where we're so busy and this happens, you don't take time to eat as much as you need to or the good things that you, that you normally would. You pay the price later on, don't you? You're more tired um, than we're, you know, jamming coffee in, in our mouths to, you know, down our throats so we could stay awake because we didn't get as much sleep the night before because we were up late doing our work. So you got to think about everything impacts everything else. There's spillover. We need to be aware of that. Okay. Now your company might set guidelines for you and usually they do how to allocate your resources. They give you guidelines based on previous experiences with buyers. They tell you, okay, you should be seeing 10 buyers a week. You should be calling this amount of people. You should be doing this. But again, that's their guidelines. Then you need to take their objectives, their goals, and look at how you can you know, merge your goals and what you do with theirs, right? There's layers here. And what they wanna basically, what we're all basically trying to do is maximize prime selling time, right? Prime selling time. Now that varies, right? We're kind of like time zone, um, we're not limited by time zones anymore. I mean, I have customers in Australia 12 hours away to 14 and a half hour time difference. So 
late at night for me is early morning for them. And I just did a program for, for CEOs, um, small, medium-sized business CEOs in Australia. It was Friday evening for me. It was Saturday morning for them. Is Friday evening a, a prime time selling time? Not usually, not unless you're going out with clients. But for me, it was because my customers are in somewhere else. So it gets to like, you could have prime time selling all the time. So again, that's not possible. So you have to allocate your resources because you need to sleep. You need to eat. You need to call on existing customers. You need to create new opportunities. You need to handle some issues that arise. Maybe not you personally, maybe people in your company, but you need to be in the know because if they're your clients and they have a problem with your service or product and you set them up to talk to somebody else in your company and that person that you set them up is not helping them, you need to know about that so you can get them somebody else, a different resource, right? Okay, so these activities, and we kind of think about this from the standpoint of planning, what are they? Basic, basic things, but, but again, we can't miss any of these. It's just, this is just a process. I want you to kind of see maybe if there's a gap in any of what you're doing. So we obviously make a list. We put it on a post-it, we put it on our calendar, what we need to be doing. Right. And then we determine once we have a list, what's most important. Right. I tell this to my clients all the time. How do we win on the field or the court? How do we win? We win W I N by noticing and doing what's important now. That's how you win. You focus on what's important now. W I N. That's the win. And if you could do that really well, you get really good at being efficient and being better at you than you were yesterday and the day before. And then you got to estimate, okay, you know, you got these tasks, you determine what's most important, how long they're going to take. And in the beginning, again, we're not great at guessing things. Sometimes we say it takes an hour, it could take two. Sometimes we say it takes 20 minutes and it takes four hours. You know, you look at, you know, this has happened. You know, I think we, I've used this analogy before. Like you go to Ikea and you get a, something to put together. And, it, and it, you, you look at the pages you're like, eh, I, can, I can knock this out in an hour. No, you can't. It takes three hours. I had to build a dresser for my son going off to college. I looked at how many pages. I'm like, Okay, I have past experience now doing this. It says it should take you an hour and a half. I'm like, mm. I'd say I, I planned two and a quarter hours. It took me two hours. So you become more efficient in planning and estimating, right? And then you develop a, a schedule for doing these activities. When do I need to do X, Y, and Z, right? Here's all my customers for the week. I'm planning, these are the priorities, these are the activities. This is most important, develop that schedule. And then, and then you compare how much time you spent with what you thought it was going to take, right? That's how we learn. We don't do it for every single task, right? Because some tasks are like, okay, go to the store and pick up X. You don't have to do that once, right? It's not like you have to be more efficient. Okay, uh, what's the best path of me driving to the store to pick up a, you know, a stick of butter? You know, because we're making, I don't know, banana bread and we need to stick a butter. So, or pick up bananas. Can I be more efficient with my time driving? Think about that. Of course you can. Can you listen? Do we listen to music while we're driving? Yes. Could you listen to a podcast? Could you just be more aware of driving and be aware of driving and not overthink about a work project? So we can compress time. We talk about that because you can do, I don't like the word use the multitask because you can't really, you can, you can divide your, your, your resource, your allocation of focus 
to a couple different things, but then you're less effective. So one thing, two things at a time, not six things like we a lot of times try to do. Multitask. Then it becomes we get hardly anything done because we're task switching. We're actually taking our attention off one thing, putting it on another, and there's a resource in the brain, a time lapse of energy and focus switching from one thing to the next. And you're not as efficient when you do that consistently, especially if you're fatigued or you're in a bad mood or you know, there's a potential threat like uh, your boss is breathing down your neck. You got to have this project done by the end of day, right? So there's a lot of things to think about. But other points to consider, okay, and ways to help us, things that we may not have thought about. All right, CRM systems, we talked a lot about that. Some people use customer relationship management systems. They help us look at our tasks. Who are we calling? How do we follow up? They can generate to-do lists for us and calendars. Have you heard this term, the tickler file? I don't know if this is still used. I mean, I, I have this in, in sales uh, for my thing. A tickler file is like a notification, you know, tickle. Um, when you should call somebody, when you should follow up, what actions to take. It used to be before phones that you do all this by hand. My God, remember, if you're old enough to remember um, these tickler files or these to-do list, actual to-do lists, I'd have file cards with each name of a customer on it. I'd write all the things on the back. We do this electronically now, of course. But imagine that I have these file cards out. The reason I'm telling you this is just to think about the process, not necessarily what I'm using, but the process. If I need to call somebody every month, I have a January, a February, a March. I have a calendar, right? I have 12 tabs in my file box. And sometimes, okay, I take one person, I call them in January, and I put them in February at a particular day, the first week, maybe. And then I look at it. So it, what it basically does is it reinforces a couple of things. What am I doing now? Where am I at? And what do I want? And what do I want is, okay, it's now April. Who is in my April tickler file? Who is in the March tickler file? Maybe I didn't connect with everybody. Okay, so you can look back and you look ahead who's in May, but you focus on now, what's important now is those people in April. And this allows you, and just know, again, this word flexibility is brilliant, right? Because we need to be flexible. Because again, we schedule more time for one thing. Sometimes it takes, sometimes your boss, this happens, right? Certainly very uh, real world life experience. Your boss calls you, you're working on three different projects. They say, you know what? I need you to do this right now. You know, Naran, your boss calls you and says, I need you to do this right now. But what about the other three projects I'm working on? No, you need to take care of this client right now, emergency. Okay, you put those three aside. It happens, and this one client might take you all day to figure it out. Put you So you do need to be flexible. And then you just kind of adapt your style again, right? It's about being adaptive, adaptive selling, adaptive communicating, adaptive time management, okay? So, there's different kinds of ways and techniques to increase time spent with customers. Kind of think about this. Obviously, you can plan, okay, when we say routing, we're just planning sales calls, okay, to minimize travel time. Say you have a big geography you have to cover, right? You don't want to, you, you use based on geography, you know, think about, think about us. We're going to do errands. 
do we do errands and keep overlapping of where we're going? We have four different errands to do, and we pass one store to get something. Then we go back home, and then we pass and go, you know, get to the other place, and we're not very efficient. So we need to look at what it is we're doing in the day to be more efficient. And then we can look at routine patterns, right? There's certain people that you have to call regularly. Notice that, who are those people? And routine is, I don't know, once a month, once a week, once a year, whatever that is regularly, we have some of those. Then variable, meaning that sometimes your customers are seasonal, meaning that maybe in spring and summer, they give you bigger orders. But in the winter, they give you nothing or very little. So you look at that call pattern based on how they're giving you business. Leapfrog and circular. Leapfrog is obviously jump from one to the other real quickly, right? Because again, sometimes something comes up, a new a potential customer gets new funding and you see, wow, now all of a sudden they just got a loan from the bank. They could bring more product in. I saw that. So you, oh, I got to go to them right now because I don't want my competitors going there. You just leapfrog. Again, you got to know your customers. You got to know where your resources are. And sometimes it's like, you know, how do you route, you know, how do you look at things? timing, like a clover leaf, right? You have a four leaf clover, right? Customers maybe are on those four parts. Where do you go? Which clover do you go to? Or is it just straight line, very easy? I have 10 customers. I call each one every month to follow up and I visit them. Usually it's not necessarily, it might be a straight line for a day. It might be all these in one day. Who knows, right? Flexible, be flexible. All right, let's look at a couple of ways to increase our time spent with customers, techniques too, okay? Because sometimes to be more efficient, we can increase our time spent, right? Efficiency, zoning. So here's, me, when I was in the textbook business, I would have professors in lots of different disciplines. So yes, they would be in business, but I would have English professors and psychology professors and those that taught um, French and those that taught uh, architecture and those that taught history um, and, and chemistry. Now, they're all in different buildings. Some are in the same buildings. I have to manage that. I have to figure out, okay, what is the best way to do that? Now, obviously I prioritize based on potential of client. The, the, bigger, the bigger potential, they, they have more students in their classes, but I can't be running from the chemistry building to the English building, to the business building, to, to the language building, to, to see the people in architecture constantly. I can't see one person here and boom. That's not efficient with my time. So what I try to do is stack. I try to zone them. I try to, okay, I'm gonna spend two hours at the business school. Who are all my top potential people in the business school in one place? And then I go, okay, what is the next highest potential? Okay, those in science, chemistry, biology, uh, geography, geology. Um, okay, so I call on those people. And then math is a big deal, so I have to make sure I have time. But I can't just be running all around. So I kind of zone, I kind of look at. And every once in a while, I like, oh yes, I have to get across campus. I have to see this professor at two because they're only in at two o'clock. So that does happen. Or I have a customer that is only available on Thursdays. So I need to make sure I clear my schedule so they're available because they only come into the office once a week because they work remotely the rest of the time. That happens now, right? So you zone, you figure out what works best for you. How do you manage that? So you may not have to manage a large territory, 
but it comes down to maybe within a project, maybe you're managing a project and within your company, there's nine people that are on the project team and they're in different departments, different functional areas. This kind of speaks to that too. How do you get everybody together? You could get a Zoom call going on, right? Or you can, you can meet on Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, wherever you're meeting, be more efficient. But the interaction sometimes is lost if you're not there in person. So sometimes you need to do both, right? All right, let's, let's uh, talk more here using email and the phone, right? We wanna be more efficient with our time. Right? Obviously, we have a phone, we have a computer, we might have an iPad, we might have some kind of tablet, so we'd be more efficient when we travel. Right. So what does it look like to use email and a phone to increase our time with customers? You're in the car, you're driving, you're walking, you're exercising. Again, you have to look at the larger picture. And I have people that do, and I see people all the time. They're taking the dog for a walk. They're just walking. They're out in the neighborhood. They're on the phone. Are you paying, how much, are you being mindful of where you're going? Or are you staring at your phone? Now, you need to be aware of that. Multitasking can be problematic. But if you're out walking with the intention of, I'm going to walk, get some exercise, and follow up with clients, awesome. Notice that. And so then you become more efficient with your time. So you get two things. You're getting your exercise and you're getting customer time. And within that, who are you calling? Are you taking other calls? Prioritizing within that time, right? So we're really looking at the fine tuning that. Obviously, you're not going to send a text or an email when you're driving, or but maybe if you're taking public transportation, you do. You can follow up that way. People are taking up planes all the time, right? Or on a train. You could be more efficient if there's a Wi-Fi connection. Maybe you don't want to. Maybe you want time to just decompress. Maybe you're looking at a book or a movie. So it's not always about, you know, um, multitasking, increasing your effectiveness. But a lot of it is by asking a question, what do I want? Where am I at? And can you do it? Obviously, here's the thing too, prospecting for potential new clients. I'm out and about. Now, if I'm a coach and I go somewhere and I see athletes and parents, Maybe I'm not going to be in selling mode, but maybe I'm going to be gathering mode. Maybe I'm, you know, out and about and just, you know, at, a, at an activity. Um, somebody wrote wrote about this, and I think it's, it's it's important. You know, I was reading some of the assignments, and you know, not a lot of people wrote this, but I'm sure we do this. Networking. How important is networking? Can we be more efficient when we go out with our time? Absolutely. Do you get new potential, new customers, new prospects? If you have a partner, if you create a partnership, can you be more effective? They can help sell for you, right? You have multiple partners reaching out to their customers to sell for you. You could be really effective with one email sent to five partners. And if it takes an hour to write that email and to give them data, but that you have five people that you're sending it to that are can, can help you, it's like a sales manager that has 10 salespeople. They can, yes, go out on a sales call with each one, and that's important. But they could also say, okay, this is a best strategy. I'm going to send an email or get on the phone and talk to all 10 or get on a, on a uh, Google Meet and talk to all 10 at once. Here's what we're doing. That's being more efficient. So just start to think about how much time do we spend answering email? How much time are we on the phone? Could we be more effective? But again, not everything could should be handled on email and phone or text. 
or social media. We just need to be aware of that, okay? Okay. Um, some of the less uh, fun kinds of things, paperwork and reports. If we're in a business, if we're in a job, and even if we're not in sales, there's paperwork. There's reports to do. Again, it may not be critical for you to do the report because your boss asked you to put it together or their boss asked your boss and you're doing the work. You may not see where it's relevant, but you got to put it together. Maybe regulators are meeting with your boss's boss or the higher up of the company. And so they need you to do this paperwork. Is there a way to do it more efficiently and effectively? And we need to determine what should we improve? Now, like if you're a salesperson, you have an expense report, right? Because you travel, you do, that's important for you. You got to get reimbursed for your money, right? It could all, it's probably all electronic, right? But you got to put it through, take, you know, your receipts and your, your traveling, okay? That takes time. You know, I spent some time um, with the local law enforcement, um, the police officers in my community. It's a, a citizens on patrol group. And so I would sometimes at the beginning of the program, spend a little time with the officers to see how they do business. Business writing tickets, business going to a call. Hopefully it wasn't, you know, something urgent. I wouldn't get out of the car if it was. Um, but a lot of times it's, you know, domestic disturbance or somebody locks their keys out of the car or something happens, traffic accidents. They have a lot of paperwork to do. And if they write a ticket, sometimes it takes a half hour for them to file the paperwork. If there's a traffic accident, it's an hour. Is that efficient? They're doing it electronically. They're entering all the data. They got to do it. Is there a way to minimize and maximize your, your time, minimize the time you're doing and maximize your efficiency? Now, here's the thing. A lot of it is attitude. If you think, oh, gosh, I got to do these reports again. Ugh, I hate these. I hate doing these reports. They take so long, and it's like, do you think you'll be as focused and as efficient doing them if you're Attitude is, I can't stand doing these. What do you think? Probably not. Now, I don't say we have to like them, but know that they're there for a reason for somebody, hopefully. And so if we have a better attitude, if we think a little more positively about it, um, we get it done. We don't let it accumulate. Some people wait a long time to get the report done. They wait to the, oh, it's, it's got to be done by the 30th of every month. And this month of February only had 28 days. So they're in trouble because they thought they would, you know, they waited to the very, very, very last minute. Um, if you have a better attitude, you do it more regularly. You don't wait for things. You're a little more efficient with your time. And so, Obviously, paperwork is not selling, right? Paperwork is not necessarily going to generate more revenue for your company because it's processing things. But it's still sometimes important because it gives you, like if you're, if you're using a CRM system and you're doing the paperwork, entering all the data on there, that takes time. And so, yes, it's not selling, but it's also giving you strategic initiatives to how to use your time later on. That's important. But can we be more efficient with that? You know, we, there's, there's software that you can just talk into, right? So we don't even have to type. You know, it's been around for a long time. So we move more efficient that way. We have abbreviated shorthand for putting things down. Are there codes? Are there systems? Yes, absolutely. All those and more. And then again, this is important here. We've got to think about evaluating our performance. How are we doing? How are we doing effectively to manage our time? How do we do with that call? 
So this gets into, you know, I mean, a lot of times we, we don't do, we, we hang up with a friend and we don't kind of evaluate how did that go, but we feel it. We notice, oh gosh, they, you know, they were in such a bad mood. <laughs> they got me in a bad mood, right? Or they were so excited, I got excited. So there's, there's spillover. And it's not necessarily you need to evaluate every conversation you have, but it's like, uh, notice, be more aware. What is driving you to feel a certain way? You know, are there people in your life that I call them energy suckers? They steal your energy because they're always negative. You might have some customers and clients like that. Got to be careful, got to protect ourselves from that. But you got to know that. What if you have friends that are like that and just by talking to them or relatives? So you got to kind of evaluate where you're spending your time. That becomes performance. So after a call, for salespeople especially, for business people especially, what occurred? What happened? What do you need to do? Write these things down. And then it becomes, again, either printed or electronically part of your management system, your territory management system, part of information to prepare for the next call. We talked about this months ago in the beginning of the class, right? Remember, in terms of what do we do on a sales call? What do we do the first time we meet a customer? How do we engage the customer? That's, this is the, you know, coming full circle here, managing that process. What do we do with the information? And then we should reflect on what happened. What were the objectives? Did we get them? What were some of the um, objections they gave us that we couldn't solve right away? Or maybe we did solve them, we can put that down because those are their hot buttons, right? So there's this analysis, there's after we meet somebody, and then there's activity analysis to say, what are we doing? Are we efficient with our time? Where are we spending our time? Is it making a meaningful difference in, in doing this? How much time am I, am I wasting? Again, 1% is all we're looking for. A little more awareness, a little more efficiency, a little more better time management, a little bit more getting better, because sometimes it's like, okay, we need to work on our questioning strategies and communicating. We need to work on that. We need to be a little bit better. So maybe we are reading a book. Maybe we are talking to our boss. Maybe we're getting a training from something online or in person. That is helpful, making us more efficient later on, okay? And then we evaluate again performance and we have to think about, okay, Based on where we were, how are we doing? So it becomes this productivity analysis. We're looking at a bunch of different things, you know? Okay, how much, how, how many customers are am I turning into a sale? How many job opportunities must I interview for to get the right job offer? How many resumes do I need to send out to get the interview, to get the, but can I be more efficient with it? Can I get an interview based on somebody I already know? That cuts a lot of the fluff out and you become more efficient. And so again, it's not always, you know, point A to point B, can I jump, can I leapfrog a process to be more efficient? And so you always think about, okay, you know, yes, I can make a hundred calls in a week, but if I made 50 and I did a little homework on all 50, maybe I could be more efficient. So it's not necessarily always a numbers game. It's a numbers with efficiency game, okay? And what is the measure of effectiveness? What is the measure? Is it just the sales calls you made? Is it just that? Is it just how many I converted? Or is it looking at the long-term value of a customer? We talked about that too. We might not know that, but if you think about it, it might take longer 
for certain customers for you to get to for to develop that relationship right that long-term business relationship that strategic partnership so maybe you spend more time there because there's more potential and you have to realize that maybe you're not seeing the benefit right away but obviously you don't put all your eggs in one basket you don't just do that you also work with those customers that convert quicker right so you just need to calculate how much time is each step right in, in this selling cycle this process of all the tasks you do of all the manage of all the projects you manage of even the one project that you're with right now all the tasks within that one project and remember think about from the very beginning there's the performance but there's the process the activities the activities i can control i can't control the the performance goals yes i might want 100 new customers in a in a year or 15 or whatever it is i can't control that that's not my day-to-day -day, you know activity my day-to-day -day activity is what is it that i can do now the win what's important now okay so let's look at this measures of evaluation just kind of start to think about this is ways that we can measure how we're doing, right? And again, if you're not in sales, think about how you do that in your job right now. Evaluation measures for total performance. You could look at it by customer type and products. Remember customer type, those that have high potential, low potential, medium potential, maybe they're past customers that you're trying to win back, all those pieces, right? And you kind of can figure out how many sales calls how much time do i need to spend on each of those converting right and am i effective doing it are my strategies effective do i need to improve anything can i be smarter of course and compare what you know perhaps i compare to certainly compare to what i did last year and what i'm doing now and maybe some of my colleagues and what they're doing but what's the industry doing right compare just know that the company will have goals you'll have goals but the industry has potential so you kind of look at what is it you know these big ticket item customers in the industry how long does it usually take to generate revenue from them it might take three years to get your software implemented in these big ticket items so that's one piece performance and then there's obviously the sales achievement the actual dollars that you're getting the actual revenue the actual sales and you rank that, you evaluate that. So is your performance where it should be? Where did you believe? What, did, what is the goal? Where am I at? What, what do I want? Did you set the right goal? Maybe you shortchange yourself. You, you, meet, you met your expectation or your goal in three months for the year. Maybe you didn't dream high enough. Maybe your goal wasn't big enough. What are your company's goals? Are you meeting those? And then you could look at dollars commission bonuses so somebody you know if somebody refers their uh, client to me and i close the sale i give a commission to those people a bonus they get 20 percent of the initial sale and so i can look at i can evaluate how much i and i love doing that because those are people i would not be able to to know on my own they help me generate a lead and so i pay them money for doing that they don't all, all know that but that i do and so then it becomes how much commission am i paying out and i can track that to know if this is a, a way i kind of look back and say hmm. and i did this i'm paying out more commission this year than i did last year that should equate to my revenue going up, and absolutely. And I, and I gave all my data to my accountant. And he, do you know what he said? He's like, one of the first things he's like, he looked at all the revenue and stuff. He's like, congratulations, good year, right? And I, you know, and I had to think about that for a moment because he was asking me about my commissions. He's like, you have a, you have a line here, how much are you giving in bonus money, commissions? And I had to, you know, and like, well, that it's X dollars. And, and I had to think about, yes, that's twice as much as last year. 
or a third more. And so then it becomes is like, am I doing a good job in helping those that I've already serviced with coaching for them to recommend me to somebody else? Have I done, done a good job with that? Maybe I can be better with that. They're selling for me. They're giving me qualified leads. So in your job, you know, and I think I read this in a couple of people's uh, assignments. Initially, you might not think, you know, you satisfy a customer and you get a client asking them for referrals. But it's huge, right? Satisfied customers provide referrals. That allows you to be more efficient with your time and your resources can't close every one, but you can close a higher percentage of those because they're warm leads, right? From a satisfied customer. You do a good job with that. This goes into why networking is so important. If you have a lot of people in your network that you know and you work with, and here's, think about this, all that we're doing here, we're talking about this time management, Think about it in terms of LinkedIn. Some social media platform where you can connect and communicate with other people. It could be LinkedIn. It could be some other platform, some other way. Okay. But think about this. Could you be more efficient with that? How are you spending your time with that? Are you getting leads from that? Are you generating leads while you're sleeping because somebody's in a different country in a different time zone selling for you, promoting you? Then you become more efficient. That is extremely powerful. Okay. That is amazing. Um, and then we can kind of think about again, here's some large categories here sales evaluation measures by customer, by product. We could kind of think about by market share, the potential, how much share of the market do I have? How many of the possible new customers I have? Or by old customers? And again, you think about how do you use that? That is, <clears throat> excuse me. That is one of the great questions. Right? How do I use it? How do I use this information? There will be an exam question on that question because I think it's a brilliant question. How do I use it? From that perspective of you have data you gathered, what do you do with it? So there's the question, what do I want? Where am I? Where am I at? And what do I want? You gather the data. What do you do with it? How do I use it? And that's the key here. So you look at your old customers. Are you servicing those accounts properly? If not, you're leaving money on the table. Your new customers. Are you building new business? How much? Market share are you getting relative to your competition? Are they driving more market share than you? Are they stealing market share, meaning that the potential of new customers is going away? You got to know that. And so then it becomes this question, how do I use it? Are your efforts in the right place? With time, things you can impact that you can control. Your prospecting, your account calls, your presentations, how often you follow up. Evaluating, right? If you think back to that first assignment, we talked about the buyer behavior process. How much time was spent in that of those eight steps in evaluation? A lot, right? Because it's so important to reflect and evaluate and see how we're doing and to notice, okay, that whole process, that last couple of steps is about evaluation. Did what I buy work? Did, did the, and the buyer is doing this, your buyer is doing this, your hiring manager is doing this for you. The employee, did I hire them? Did I do a good job? 
Was I effective with that? Absolutely. So we, we need to do the same, right? And so just kind of start to think about a few other things here, and we're kind of going to close this out. Um, it's the stages, the self-management process. It, just a little different look at it here. Okay, we set goals, right? We design the strategy. We had this in a, in a graphic, but I want to clearly, because this is important. We implement the time and, and strategy, and territory strategy, and we evaluate four, you know, um, five, you know, four cornerstones kind of thing. And within the goals, right, we evaluate, we, we sift through the goals, right? What do I want? Where am I at? Where am I at? What do I want? And so that's what it becomes, this whole process. Oop. This whole process is about that. I'm going to stop the share because that's it for the... the uh, Okay, so um, in the in the book we have just a couple of more chapters left. We're kind of closing out sales operations and the selling process. I think you can kind of see the time management piece. It's useful for everything, and we do have resources we use right now. A lot of them are electronic, but start to think about in your downtime. Could you be more efficient with your downtime, even in the uptime how can we be more efficient with that are we again you don't have to micromanage every single minute of 86,000 seconds a day because some of them were sleeping hopefully um, but it's about awareness about self-awareness about noticing what's working and what's not working and doing more of what works and less of what doesn't that's what the selling process is about, right? It's communicating and communicating effectively, adapting your style. And time management is one piece. Managing your resources, your territory, your uh, project is another big piece. And so we kind of need to look at things a little bit more um, from the perspective of Am I being as efficient as I can be? And how can I how can I be a little bit more efficient? I say one percent. Again, one percent a day equates to forty two percent in a year. Imagine you have one percent in one area, maybe one percent in five areas of your life, not just your your job, but other places then it becomes incredible efficiency, right? The example I gave of the client who was stringing a tennis racket took two hours. We're gonna have things like that. We're not good in the beginning. It takes longer, get more efficient, get better. You could also pay somebody to string your racket, right? But his dad, this kid's dad got, he was like looking at, he was evaluating, how much money am I spending on new rackets being strung? And can I buy a machine to do it and spend less money and less resources and be more effective with my dollar? We make these decisions and choices all the time. And so that's what we're doing. So it's just about looking at things a little bit more, little bringing a little more awareness to what we're doing. All right? So that's what I have for you today. We finished well, finished more efficiently with our time, right? Because we have a few minutes extra. Um, a couple of reminders. Those, and I'm looking at who's on the call. I think everybody on the call already turned in their assignments. Those that are watching on the recording, assignment number two was due yesterday. Please still do uh, turn it in. Um, if, know that the last quiz for chapter 14, that will be the last one, is eight questions. That's posted for last week. Um, I've had some people that weren't able to get to every quiz. I've had to open some of those up to expand the time. This last quiz goes to the end of April. So 
Obviously, the grades are due before that. So get to this last quiz. Again, it's eight questions. Um, uh, the other piece here, and I mentioned this in the, the WhatsApp group, is that from now on, because of some travel arrangements and some travel constraints for me, we're going to continue with uh, meeting on Tuesdays. Okay. So for the rest of April, where there's only what three classes left to meet. Um, we're going to be meeting on Tuesdays, three and then the final. Um, so Tuesdays, 10 a.m. Eastern. And again, I apologize if people can only be here on the weekends, um, but everything will be on recording. So you'll be able to interact that. And again, for the final exam, I'm going to open it up so you'll have more than a week. I want to give you maybe 10 plus days to get that done um, because people travel and I know and I'm becoming busier in my travel time. That's why we have to move to Tuesdays. All right. Um, so I will see everybody here next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, look for that additional quiz for chapter uh, 14. Professor, let me yes. request. Uh, I have a travel for, to answer the some uh, starting from week six, chapter seven, sir. Uh, I haven't finished uh, any quiz. Uh, let me answer again. Okay, so chapter six. To enter um, now. Okay, um, so I'll have to look at that and and I will open that up. Um, I'll I'll give you another day to get that done if you can get that done. Yeah, in the thank next you. Twenty four hours. Uh, okay. Next okay. week I'm I'm able to answer. Yes. Okay. Yes. All thank right, you. and I, and again I know travel happens and things, and I have posted up there. Ashraf, you have a question. <clears throat> yeah, but Professor, uh, I cannot uh, download the slide uh, for chapter number nine. Uh, the link contains only slide for chapter number eight, and I think number nine is not there. Okay, it. I, I think somebody had. Um, we had talked about that with somebody else. Um, they're there. It may just be you have to scroll through all the materials. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll recheck that again. But I believe every chapter should be on there. Um, but I'll look at chapter nine as well. So um, chapter nine PowerPoint. Um, I did perfect uh, chapter nine is uh, combining with the chapter eight. OK, so it is. So they're both there. OK. All right. I'll make sure both PowerPoints are on there, but I, I believe that both are there. You just have to click out of one to get into the other one. Um, but I should have uploaded. Um, both um, but I think somebody did bring that up and I did check it. It, it, it it's good it may just be the way Moodle is set up you can't see it right away um, and I know there was a reorganization of Moodle in March I think they changed the formatting and it looks a little different than it was so I'll I'll, I'll look at that and make sure you can get access yeah to thank you chapter. thank you're you. welcome all right, so I'll open up chapter six again, the quiz, and I'll look into the PowerPoints. All right, so everybody, thank you for being here um, live. Those that are watching recording, you know, I'm sorry we can't be live, but um, you're getting the information in, you know, being this is an online class, you're still getting the information just in a little different way. All right, so everybody, thank you very much for being there. Chapter 14 quizzes up. Look at that. Um, get those quizzes in that you haven't completed yet. Make sure you're there. If again, there's a problem where you say, oh, oh gosh, I, I forgot to get this quiz and it's already past the point. Let me know um, and I'll open it up for you just so you can get that done. All right. All right. So I see everybody here next Tuesday. You're very welcome. Um, you know, Sean, look look for that. I'll I'll go in there as soon as we're done here. I'll I'll open up that quiz for you. You can you can start working on that right away. Okay. You so you're you're welcome. All right, and Ashraf, I'll take a look at those slides. Make sure that they're available for you. Okay. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your week. I'll see everyone here next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern. No more Saturday meetings for uh, the next couple of classes. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, uh, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.